Hello everyone and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions and how to reduce them into a systemic, socially just and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide from Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode, we will look about one of my newfound loves, urban environmental history. Uh, more specifically, today we will talk about how food cycle and the shape of our cities were, were and still are int intimately connected. In fact, we don't seem to care that much about it, but every day food travels from around the planet to our plates and we have no idea how. Um, while in the past, the main preoccupation of our cities was to supply enough food for its citizens, else there were riots, today we consider this as granted. As we will see, this happened through a sequence of technical inventions, economic incentives and planning regulations that transformed this urban slash food nexus. To talk about this uh, topic today, we have Carolyn Still, an architect, lecturer, speaker and author who has spent the last 20 years investigating the relationship between food and cities. She is the author of two books, um, Hungry City, How Food Shapes Our Lives, and Sidopia, which I enjoyed to read very much, mostly Hungry City. And it resonated very much with the topic of urban metabolism research that I enjoy very much through this study, this socio-ecological transition study. Just before kicking off this episode, I'd like to make a small request from you. If you like these episodes, please share them around with your colleagues and friends um, and tell us what you have liked or learned. If you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and leave a comment with your thoughts. With all that being said, uh, hi, Carolyn, and welcome to this podcast. Hi, Aristide. Great to be with you. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Could you perhaps uh, explain a bit the trajectory of an architect becoming uh, a food scientist, in a way. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a long one. Um, that's a bit like saying, tell, tell me the story of your life. Um, <laughs> I'll try to keep it fairly short. I mean, basically, uh, from a very young age, I wanted to be an architect. And I don't know why, by the way, because none of my family are architects. In fact, they're all medical, so it made no sense, really. But but from a very young age, I was fascinated by buildings. And um, and then, you know, I studied architecture at Cambridge, actually. And I would say almost immediately, I began to realize that there was something that interested me about architecture, which wasn't what was being taught to me, you know. So for an obvious reason, you know, architects talk a lot about buildings. <laughs> they talk about, you know, kind of um, Corinthian columns and gutter details and U values through walls and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, well, okay, this is all fine. But uh, there was something else, you know, that, that for me that began from that point, I was going, ooh, but there's something else that I'm I'm interested in, but it's not being talked about. What is it, what is it, what, what is it? And um, this feeling just grew in me. And to cut an incredibly long story short, <laughs> I think the reality is that what was missing for me was life. You know, I think what was missing was literally that. And of course, architects, you know, what they're trying to do is build buildings or cities or spaces in which people can thrive. So that is the intention. But buildings are so complicated and it takes so much to sort of get all the bits right. And, you know, the kind of air flows and the water flows and whatever it is, that um, I think for me, from, from quite early on, I, I sort of thought, well, but what about actually us? What about our relationship with the buildings? You know, and of course, I'm post-rationalising all of this, but anyway, I think that's basically what it was. Now, from the, the, the moment I started feeling that, which is probably when I was about 18 years old, to the moment that I had the idea of writing about a city through the lens of food, which was when I was 40 years old, you can see this was a long <laughs> time and it was like an illness in me. It was like a sort of a burning thing that became stronger and stronger and stronger. And of course, during that period, I qualified as an architect. I started teaching architecture and urban design. I, I actually was a Rome scholar. I went to Rome and, 
And, and in my study and in my work, very often I would put food into, you know, into either my students' projects, I would give them food related things to design, or when I went to Rome, I actually studied the market area. And looking back, I think, you know, I was drawn to food because, because it was where life was, you know, you know, if there's a market or something, there's going to be lots of people around. And if you're studying a kind of historical area, then it's the market where you're going to have evidence of daily life being led rather than just a which emperor won which battle when sort of thing, which is the kind of history that just bores me rigid, you know. Um, so <laughs> um, again, long story short, um, I then went to, to teach at the London School of Economics, actually. I was the first uh, design convener of the city's programme there. And this was kind of heavenly for me because, you know, I had for the first time sociologists, anthropologists, traffic people, housing people, economists, and so on, all talking about the city in one room. And this is what I'd been missing, was the sort of a much broader discourse about what the city was and, and all the rest of it. But even then, I found that people were still stuck in their silos, you know, and the politicians thought thought like politicians and the architects thought like architects and so, so on and so on. So it was actually after I was the LSE and it was in conversation with a colleague of mine from there called Roger Zagolovich. Uh, and I was really desperate by this point because I, I knew I was so close to something but I couldn't feel what it was. And it was actually in a conversation with him. I actually propositioned him. I said, let's write a book together about cities. And we were chatting and I, during that conversation, and this was April 2000, by the way, I had the idea suddenly, how would it be if you were to describe a city through the lens of food? And this was just like the biggest light bulb of my life going off. And I still now, even now I get, you know, chicken skin when I tell this story, because it was just huge. I knew instantly, okay, this is my thing. This is, this is what I've been searching for. And of course, food had been there for years and architecture had been there for years, but I hadn't been able to put these things together. And I literally almost ran out of the room, you know, that moment <laughs> as I knew and started working. I need pen and yeah, paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just like, oh my God, this is my thing at last, you know. And then, and I began working immediately. I mean, that, that week, I joined the London Library. I typed the word food into the subject index. I took the first 10 books out that came up. Very luckily for me, the very first book I read was a wonderful book called The Culture of Food by Massimo Montanari, which is just a wonderful book. And I was so excited. And I, within a week, I had the structure of Hungry City, which, as you know, is the journey of food through the city, because I'm an architect. So I, I think spatially, I think in terms of, you know, sort of what I can see. And, um, and really also within a week, roughly, I thought, um, hang on a minute, you know, asking the question of how do you feed a city is a bit like saying, what is civilization? You know, this is an absolutely huge question and I'm not qualified to ask this question, you know, let alone answer it, you know. So I had this weird thing then and that's never left me of why is it me asking this? You know, why, you know, I, I think I just said to you, you know, sort of I thought that there must be a whole section in the library about this. And I was looking desperately, do you have a section on feeding cities? And people would look at me, no, what are you talking about? You know, and it's just the weirdest thing. And so the whole way through writing Hungry City, which took seven years, by the way, because it's a big subject. Mm -hmm. And I'm a slow <laughs> writer and researcher, obviously, as well. I thought I had this dual feeling of, I've found my thing, I've found my thing at last, but also who am I to do this? It's so huge. And that, as I say, has never left me that feeling. It's still with me now, except I've been doing it now for 22 years. <laughs> Nobody seems to stop me. <laughs> you know, and, and I think actually maybe only an architect with a kind of brain like, like I have. So I have what I call a cloud brain. You know, so I don't remember fact very easily. I see things spatially and I see connections. It's all like a big cloud in my head. And I think that is why the enormity of the subject never scared me. You know, I had the, the journey of food, as I say, from the beginning as, as my structure. So I knew what that was. Um, and of course, I remember the day, I mean, literally it's gonna make you laugh, but I remember the day when I thought, oh, oh God, I don't know anything about farming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to learn about farming you know and it's just this kind of the craziness of it you know but of course I needed to learn about farming and everybody needs to learn about farming and it just 
it took its own course. But of course, every time I came across something like that, I knew where in the book it should go. But, and that was the value of having, as I say, this structure from the beginning is it was never like, oh, where do I put, you know, table manners or where do I put obesity? Actually, obesity was interestingly difficult because that could, could either go in the eating chapter or the waste chapter, because in a way, obesity is a form of waste, you could say. I, anyway, anyway, um, I'm talking a lot, but, you know, it was a, an extraordinary thing. Uh, as I say, it was an extraordinary transformation in my life. And, uh, and that is the short version I just gave you, by the way. So. Of course, of course. <laughs> We're talking about the 20 year uh, old. Yeah, yeah, journey, yeah, so, yeah, 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 indeed. But that's kind of how it happened in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for, for the ones that haven't read the, the book, there, there are seven chapters, if I remember well, mm -hmm. starting from the land, supplying the city, the market and the supermarket, the kitchen, at table, waste and Cytopia. Mm -hmm. And over there, um, so it's funny because you say this is an architect approach of taking things, but if you were an uh, environmental engineer, probably mm. you would have taken the same elements or the same processes to study. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. were an urban environmental historian, you would have probably taken the same one. So it's funny how, even if I think, even if you say this is from an architect point of view, I'm not sure, I mean, I don't read it uh, and see uh, architecture, let's say hints <laughs> in it. Um, so yeah. let's say if we want to develop this and and describe a bit this extremely complex relationship between food and cities. Mm, yeah. And you go through the, these life cycle stages of food through cities. Yeah. And you also provide a um, historical element to it, a bit like uh, Brodel does in his yes. old, old books. I love Brodel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, what a hero. It's amazing. Amazing. I use those books a lot. Incredible books. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. I mean, mm. it seems like a staple to have someone describe what civilization was over centuries, right? But yes. we don't have this element. Yes. So I'm wondering how do you like to start off or how do you start off this complex relationship? Do you start it by a figure, by a statistic? Mm -hmm. by How do you begin to, to explain this complex relationship? Yeah, the enormity of this. Yeah. There are so many ways of doing this. I mean, actually my, most, my, my favorite, most recent way of saying it is that in a bowl of soup or a bowl of pasta, or it doesn't matter, any bowl of food in front of you is the universe. It's really that, that simple and that complex. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about what goes into a bowl of soup, you know, there are vegetables. What are vegetables? Well, they're living things. You know, they've evolved over, you know, thousands, possibly millions of years. You know, they've they've grown somewhere, they've grown in a landscape. You know, what was that landscape like? You know, what was the soil like? You know, who grew those vegetables? Were they, were they farmers? Were they producers? Did they work in a shed? Did they work in a field? Were they paid enough? You know, who paid them to bring that, you know, the leeks and potatoes, whatever it is, you know, how did it get from wherever it was to the city? You know, how was it kept fresh? You know, was it chilled? Was it gassed? You know, was it driven? Did it go on a ship or a train or a plane? You know, where did it end up? You know, did, did it, when did it change hands? When did money change hands? Who paid who and when and who got the profit? And, and then, and how was it grown anyway? You know, did they use machines? Did they use oil? Did they use their hands? Did they use hose? Did they use tractors? Did they use horses? You know, I mean, just this whole, you know, what technologies were used, what skills were used, what culture was used, who decided to grow these things in the first place, you know, and then here they come. And, you know, did you, did you cook it yourself? Did you go to a market? Did you meet other humans when you bought these food, you know, these, the leek or potatoes, whatever it was, or did you go to a supermarket or did somebody deliver it to you? And what does all that mean? And then why did you decide to cook this in the first place? What is your culture? You know, did you value it? How much did you pay for it? Is it organic? Is it not organic? Did it destroy the soil or nurture the soil? You know, and then how did you cook it? Did you have a saucepan? You know, was it a nice one? Was it a, who made it? Who designed that saucepan? You know, sort of what gas did you use? What, what energy? You know, did you start with a wooden spoon? Where did the wood come from? You know, it just, it just goes on and on and on. And then there's the soup. Did you eat it on your own? Did you eat it with someone else? Did you have a nice conversation while you ate the soup? You know, was it 
cook with love? You know, did somebody else cook it for you? You know, was it your parent, your, you know, your friend or, or whatever? And then did you eat all of it? And if not, where's the waste going to go? And is the waste going to go back in the cycle again? And, and by the way, who made the bowl that you ate the soup out of? You know, what was the bowl made of? Was it made of ceramics? Was it made out of metal? Who made that? Who designed that? It goes on, it goes on. And then, you know, so this is what I say. It's sort of, if you think about food, food is us. I mean, by the time you're about 25 years old, there are no atoms in your body that you were born with. All the atoms in your body you've, uh, are food you've eaten. So we are literally made of the meals that we've eaten in our lives. You know, so that slightly blows my mind. And, you know, we know what you are, what you eat, but it's actually at a more profound level than we realise. And, you know, our connection to the world is through food. You know, it's a physical connection. So basically, when I eat my leek and potato soup that I'm just using as an example, I am literally eating nature. I'm eating a landscape. I'm eating a piece of the living world. And by the way, that was a living thing. That leek or potato was a living being that somebody killed on my behalf so that I can live. So food, that chain is the chain of life you know, which is of course why there is no such thing as cheap food. So we are indeed talking about, because, you know, to, to cheapen food is to cheapen life. So, and, you know, of course, at, at a certain level, as I say, you know, the sort of microbes in this, this uh, soup that we will never even know what half of them are probably, but, you know, those came directly from the soil, you know, they then end up in our gut. They're part of the plant's immune system that becomes part of our immune system. And there's a amazing sort of synergies between our microbiome and a plant's rhizosphere, you know, and, and we're only just learning about this stuff, by the way. And I get much more interested, you know, when they invent these new my, 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 microscopes that can just look sort of closer and closer at what's going on, you know, in us and in our world. And I do about, of course, it's exciting to be able to, see the big bang as well but you know just in an exactly analogous way just as we're getting better and better at sort of seeing into the distant past in the universe we're getting better and better at seeing into the essence of life on earth and and you know so that is food to me food is life um it's all of life and 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 you can and the beautiful thing is even though it's unbelievably complex we understand it intuitively because we all eat, because we wouldn't be here if we didn't eat. So that bowl of soup or pasta or whatever it is that you know intuitively because you've eaten it many times in your life, the universe is in that bowl of soup. So this is the power of food as a way of thinking. It's just a phenomenal medium uh, for understanding connectivity and value and everything you need to really know about is in that bowl of soup. But in, in your work, you go a step further. So you don't only look at the relationship of human civilization and food. You also look at cities uh, and their relationship uh, with food. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's kind of um, <laughs> more, more or less we can guess that you say that the birth of cities coincides with the birth of agriculture. Yes. And, yes. and it's whenever you think about it, you, you kind of think, is this a chicken or egg situation? Yeah, what, yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I mean, by the way, you know, I just read um, an amazing book that I think everyone who's interested in these kinds of issues would really enjoy reading. It's called The Dawn of Everything. It's by the late lamented David Graeber, um, who some people might know from his amazing work on debt, for example, and also on bullshit jobs. I mean, you know, it's just, it's tragic that he died last year, but anyway, he's, he's left a lot of amazing work behind. You know, what's amazing about that book is that um, what it really tells you about is, is the fact that, you know, thing, things like cities evolved over time and, and activities like agriculture evolved over time but they didn't necessarily do them in the same place at the same time, you know, so there's an incredible complexity to this, but, you know, out of, I mean, what I will describe as a, as a 10,000 year period, let's say roughly, of people experimenting with agriculture and experimenting with living in static settlements that may or may not have been fed 
to a lesser or greater degree by a thing that we might call farming, um, you know, we do arrive at a point where you get large enough settlements that actually the only way of feeding would be through a form of farming. So for example, you know, I live in London, you know, there's no way um, that you could feed a city the size of London through hunting and gathering. I mean, this is sort of blindingly obvious. So, you know, we have reached this point and, you know, I think there's a sort of, there's a key moment in the Fertile Crescent um, and elsewhere in the world, by the way, but, you know, it seems to have happened first in the Fertile Crescent, which is, you know, so cool because it's, you know, fertile and crescent shaped, an area of the ancient Near East where many plants and animals were domesticated for the first time. Um, and the interesting thing about domestication is that, you know, if you think about um, a wild plant that you might just kind of, you know, we all kind of maybe, I mean, in England, you know, um, we still eat blackberries. That's probably the only foraging anybody does anymore. You know, you sort of pick a blackberry on the way that happens to be on the side of the road. But I mean, a wild plant doesn't need us. It just gets on with its life, basically. Whereas when you start to domesticate a plant, what happens is that you start to select plants for certain characteristics and it's probably things like bigger fruit or bigger seed or you know more edible bits shall we say but the more that you select for those kind of more edible plants the less the plant tends to keep its own natural defensive systems and there comes a point where it when it's domesticated when it relies on us and that's the point where our relationship with food basically completely changes because uh, and, and there's a brilliant term that I absolutely love in um, Dawn, of, Dawn of Everything, the book I did, where they talk about play farming. So they say for about 3,000 years, you know, in the Fertile Crescent, people understood about domestication. They, they, they had the techniques to do it, but they chose not to do it. Now, why could that possibly be? And the answer is, well, once you've domesticated a plant or indeed an animal, it relies on you. You have to feed have to water it you have to protect it and critically you have to stay next to it you know you can't just wander off so I think there's something very very fascinating here about you know our evolving relationship with the plants and the animals that we eat which is that we we make them sort of suit us better by domesticating them but then they rely on us and this alters the way we live so we go from being shall we say predominantly sort of wandering people you know most hunter-gatherers one, I mean, some have semi-static settlements, but you know, or they they stay encamped in a particular place for a certain amount of time. But generally, you're not stuck in any one place. You can wander off if you want to, you know. Um, and what changes with with farming, or you know, particularly sort of proper farming, as I would call it, you know, farming where it's to do domesticated crops and actually you know, sort of watering, protecting and all the rest of it, you have to stay by the food. So you, you get stuck. Um, now, the advantage of this, of course, is that, you know, you evolve sources of food like grain, for example, which are very easy to produce. Well, easy is the wrong word, but which is possible to produce with a lot of hard work uh, and skill. Um, quite a lot of, in fact, more than your local population needs. And we actually see this with the first cities, for example, you know, in ancient Mesopotamia, you know, settlements that are complex enough that everybody agrees they, they can be called proper cities. Those cities very rapidly got to the point where they were able to grow more grain than their population needed. And that was great. Then they begin exporting it. So you, almost from the very beginning, you start to get food trade, you know, and amazingly, you know, Sumerian cities like Uruk and Ur and so on, they were exporting grain as far as India, you know, 2000 years BC sort of thing. So, I mean, it, it's, it's really phenomenal that, that immediately that you get the evolution of cities. And as you say, the co-evolution of agriculture and cities which although complicated is nevertheless a thing and absolutely grain is the food of cities. And that's a very important takeaway when you come on to talking about, for example, industrial meat, you know, and what, what that, you know, the, the impact of that ecologically. Um, it, it immediately becomes a money-making operation as well as a feeding a population operation is what I'm saying, you know, and then you start to get a very interesting political division between 
cities that struggle to feed themselves and, you know, like Paris, for example, and cities that don't struggle to feed themselves like London. And that becomes, you know, a, a very, very powerful shaper of politics, uh, because basically, you know, if you have access to the sea in the ancient world, then you can generally feed yourself easily because, of course, the feeding is just about producing enough food. It's also about transporting the food to the city. And in the ancient world, the sea or water was how you did that. It's estimated to have been 42 times cheaper uh, to transport over, over water than over land um, or by sea than over land. Uh, which, of course, is why, you know, how it was possible, for example, for a city like Rome to grow to the size that it did, because it just expanded its empire to include, you know, the whole of the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the North Atlantic, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, you're always talking about geography, you know, when you're talking about the sort of evolution of cities, um, you're talking about a lot of things immediately, of course, because I've already mentioned politics, I've already mentioned economy, I've already mentioned trade. You know, you're talking about everything always with food. But the critical thing absolutely is that you cannot have a city without countryside. And, and, and this is, you know, something that those of us who live in cities and think of ourselves as urban, and as, as you said in your introduction, who just, you know, dial up a curry at two in the morning and it arrives <laughs> as if by magic, we might not necessarily think about. But somewhere, you know, wherever there's a city, there is a productive hinterland that may or may not be visible that is feeding it. And, and it's often, by the way, about 100 times bigger than the city, obviously, depending on the density of the city. Um, but yeah, and, and I call this the urban paradox, by the way, the paradox being that as political animals, which is a sort of term that Aristotle used, you know, there's a sort of inherent duality in us now that we live in cities. Because if you think about a hunter-gatherer, I call it living in the larder. They literally live in, in a world that directly feeds them. Whereas if we live in a city, you know, we we need sustenance that comes from a place that we, we even know exists or may not have any consciousness of at all. Um, and so the paradox is how do we create, you know, access for political animals to you know, politics, which refers to society, the fact that we need to live together, we are social animals, but we're also animals, which means we need access to nature. So it's how to square those two things, how to give us access to society and nature, or if you like, city and country, which is a very, very ancient question. I mean, it actually goes back to the beginning of us having lived in cities. So we've been asking this question, shall we say, for 5,000 years without necessarily finding all the answers. You, you have, uh, yeah, uh, indeed, th that was one of the questions I had, this, this duality between city and country. Um, well, there is the romantic side of countryside, there is the barbaric side of countryside, there is um, the productive side of countryside. So there is so many elements about how we see, well, productive hinterlands, as you call them, but also the... The, the the place where some aristocrats also have a secondary home for some yeah for, for some cases yeah I mean this is something that interests me a lot so obviously as you say there's a huge amount to say about the countryside I mean probably the sort of the primary thing to say about the countryside is that it's an urban construction um, and you know it's really modified nature and it's something you know it, it's it's an artificial landscape if you like which is modified in order to feed the city so there's always a sort of unevenness in the relationship between the city and the country from the beginning because the power and the narrative and the money all tend to reside in the city so even though we have you know wonderful examples like the incredible ambrogio lorenzetti fresco that i always talk about in siena about you know the relationship between the city and the countryside which is obviously ideal and is a utopian ideal um in fact, the power has always resided in the city. And that's, of course, always been one of the issues, um, you know, through history, if you like, is, is that, you know, although there's a theoretical partnership between city and country, and certainly a lot of economists and politicians talk about it as a partnership, uh, and of course, the countryside benefits from the existence of the city, because it can 
make goods for the city, you know, and Adam Smith writes about this, for example, um, you know, that, that even though the sort of the city doesn't actually produce raw materials or energy, it does manufacture. And, you know, there's the, and this is the basis of the economy, for example. Um, but I think we know where most of the money tended to end up. Uh, and of course, that that sort of imbalance between city and countryside has only got greater over time. And as the sort of, you know, the, as I say, if you look at, again at that Lorenzetti um, fresco, which shows Siena and it just shows the landscape that feeds Siena together. And it's it's it's, you know, it's an extraordinary image. Um, you know, today, of course, we don't look out of our windows and see the landscapes that feed us. And this, of course, is. Um, is a huge issue and and because it means that we are both physically and mentally separated from this necessary other half of our urban lives um and of course as we know as that distance has grown greater so has the artificialization of the landscape you know so i often show in another image sorry i'm trying to give you a lecture without slides now but you know i often show another lecture of you know, that incredible shot that you have of a Brazilian soy field, you know, with this kind of phalanx of, I'm sure lots of people have seen it, you know, phalanx of um, combine harvesters, you know, guided by a drone, you know, and often there's a phalanx of seed drills coming behind, you know, so the land gets half an hour of downtime before it gets re-sown, you know, and we know that this is completely unsustainable over time, you know, and, and, and again, I come back to this thing of, you know, the artificiality of cheap food, the fact that we've chosen to create uh, the illusion that there is such a thing as cheap food, whereas in fact there is not, there can never be, because as I say, food is life. Um, so yes, the countryside's the urban construction. I mean, in Hungry City, I write about the way, you know, you go through periods in history when urban people, go, they start to fantasise about the countryside and you get all these kind of pastoral traditions. And I mean, particularly interestingly, I find this hilarious, actually. It's happening again now, of course, but, you know, usually at times when some quite vicious agricultural transformation is taking place, and I say vicious because it usually means pushing people off the land so you can be more, quote-unquote, efficient in how you farm. You know, so, for example, this is what happened, you know, with the English, uh, explicitly English agricultural revolution was that you had uh, enclosure, land enclosure, and the peasants were all pushed off the off the land. But of course, they needed the peasants to go and work in the factories shortly afterwards because the agricultural revolution was followed by the industrial revolution. Um, but at the same time that's going on, in the city you get this kind of, you know, these paintings of this beautiful bucolic scenes and, you know, people kind of having picnics, you know, sort of under the trees and birds tweeting away and everything. And you get this sort of really weird sort of cognitive dissonance about sort of the fantasy of the countryside that, you know, city people like to have and the reality. And there's always been a mismatch between those two things. And of course, today we see it because we know, for example, if you buy, you know, a litre of milk or something, you will have a happy cow on it, you know, with grass and of sun shining and everything. But we know that the vast majority of the cows that produce our milk never go outdoors, you know, they they live their whole lives inside. So again, the sort of the, the fantasy that we want to have about the countryside and the reality are often are often very different. And of course, this allows the, if you like, the sort of the degradation of the countryside to take place, because because we just don't, we just don't see it. Um, you know, and I mean, it's, it's terrible to sort of, um, to, to invoke the, the Ukraine war that's going on at the moment in this sense. But you know, you can see that if people are given a certain story, as in people in Russia are told, you know, they're given nothing but propaganda, they just don't see it. And actually, we're also fed propaganda about food the whole time. Um, even, you know, even with total access to the Internet, you know, if there's a strong enough cultural narrative that things are a particular way, most people choose to believe it because it's more comfortable. And, you know, most people just want to get on with their lives. You know, most people don't want to spend their entire time like you do and I do worrying about the world and trying to find out what's really going I mean you know it's a sort of it's a kind of state of mind you might even call a sickness that that, that most people don't have um so I would say there's a sort of there's a narrative uh, that's a, you know a bit like propaganda about what food is and how it's made that is um that conceals the truth
Yeah, I mean, we had a, a previous episode. This was in French on the urban-rural relationships yeah. um, and how mainly, of course, they're predative in terms that the city takes rather than gives back. But yeah. uh, I'm wondering, um, how did we go about this? Because beforehand, we we knew the value of food. If mm. food was not supplied, it meant civil unrest, it meant, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, still, empires still clashing. Does. Still does, by the way. Still does. You're right, you're right. That's what's interesting. You know, that hasn't gone away. We pretend it's gone away. But I mean, even during lockdown, you know, I mean, and, and I, I'm ashamed of my own country, but you know, the, the things that people were literally fighting each other over were things like cans of tomatoes and, and dried spaghetti because, you know, this is in Britain, but nobody really cooks, you know, so and people were panicking. You know, there were grown men wrestling grannies to the ground for the last, you know, packet of spaghetti. I mean, you know, and that's when there wasn't even a food shortage because actually there were plenty of fresh vegetables left, but people didn't, didn't know what to do with this. So, so yes, I mean, sorry, I interrupted you, but, but no, absolutely. I mean, I write a lot in the book, as you say, about the fact that, you know, the, the value of food was well understood in history. And this is because, you know, it's, it's um, availability was extremely precarious always, you know, and, you know, I mean, I've, I, I remember being astonished when I read that, you know, one in three harvests in Europe used to fail. This is in the early modern period, you know. So, I mean, just think about it, you know. And, um, of course, this then becomes, I don't know whether you want me to talk more about the, the whole Paris-London thing. But, you know, I mean, Paris always struggled to feed itself because the Seine is not navigable. So, again, geography. Geography becomes politics, becomes economics, becomes potentially war. And it ultimately did become, of course revolution um you know the city struggled to feed itself so it literally went into the countryside and extracted food from you know rural folk by force to feed itself this was as you can imagine a very popular um <laughs> policy not and i mean you know you cannot disassociate food from politics and it's it's certainly true that you know it's with industrialization And one can absolutely understand why, you know, when, I mean, and there's so many things to talk about here, but, you know, the railways are critical in this because, of course, what the railways do is they allow food to be transported rapidly over long distances, which, to a certain extent, as I put it, emancipates cities from geography for the first time. Um, but, you know, also the sort of um, the, the ruthless processing plants, so, for example, Chicago, which effectively you know, pretty much invented the modern food industry in many ways because it was very strategically placed in the middle of the, the Great West. If you think of all those cowboy movies you used to see with all those great cattle drives, that's Texan longhorns coming up through Texas. They're getting to Chicago, which used to be a depot because it was at the bottom of the Great Lakes geography yet again. Um, and, of course, the, the market was the eastern seaboard, which is where all the big cities were. But then when the railways came... Chicago immediately became the, you know, the network hub of the, you know, the whole of that, you know, not just the Midwest, but actually ultimately the whole of the North America. And what happened was, um, well, let's just mention the Native Americans who used to live there alongside millions of bison on all of this extraordinary grassland. Uh, they got either slaughtered or removed um to reservations the bison were were killed and that then this actually became the world's first vast monocultural grain producing region and for the first time in history there was more grain than people could eat you know i mean it, there was just 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 millions of acres of the stuff um and so what do you do with grain when you there's too much to eat you you feed it to cattle And this is the beginning of, you know, sort of what we now know as, as basically the predominant, unfortunately, you know, so-called factory farming or the predominant way of, of producing uh, livestock or rearing livestock globally. And of course, we could be eating the grain. Um, and of course, you know, cattle, we co-evolved with cows um, because they can eat grass. And we can't eat grass, but we can drink their milk and we can eat their meat. So, you know, that's there's, there's a beautiful ecology about our relationship with cattle that got destroyed by this. In fact, there's a wonderful author in the UK called Simon Fairley, um, who wrote a, a great book called Meat, a Benign Extravagance. And there's a lot of complex argument in it. But what he's basically saying 
is that we do need meat in the farming system because basically, sorry, I'm saying lots of different things, but this is the thing about food. They all connect. You know, that's what I love about it. You know, if we want to farm regeneratively, which clearly we do, we have to now, it's beyond choice now, then we need animals in the system because what regenerative farming does is it mimics what nature does. And hello, natural ecosystems have animals in them for a reason, you know, because they're part of the system and because they're great, you know, sort of, uh, transmit you know sh they, they shift the nutrients they help push the nutrients around the cycle and so on anyway but of course if you interrupt that and if you just feed cattle grain that we could easily be eating I mean it's just I mean Simon Fairley calls it you know the greatest ecological catastrophe of our age basically because a we could be feeding you know 10 times as many people if we just date the grain directly b it makes the cattle sick you've probably covered this in other episodes you know this whole thing um and and see, uh, you know, the animals actually have a constant sort of case of indigestion because they weren't designed to eat grain. They'll eat it like we eat, you know, fast food, you know, but it's not good for them. So we pump them full of antibiotics. So the wind have an antibiotic crisis, blah, blah. I mean, it's just insane, basically. Anyway, but but this is where all of that was really invented. And, and, and critically also, interestingly, the chill chain. You know, so I, I've talked before about, you know, the difficulty of transporting food into the city. Basically, it was the Chicago and meat packers who, you know, they had all this grain pouring into Chicago. They had all these animals that they're fattening them up. Amazing. Their market's a thousand miles away on the East Coast because America's a big place. So what do they do? And what they did, and I, I love this, actually, it was a beautiful fact um, Gustavus Swift, which is one of the biggest meat packers in Chicago, he built his own railroad to the East Coast along the edge of the Great Lakes. And they used the lakes to cut ice out during the winter. So he built a series of ice houses along the route. And then he could hang blocks of ice at either end of his uh, rail cars and hang his meat carcasses in between. And that basically invented the chill chain. That basically meant that the meat could stay fresh it could arrive fresh on the East Coast. And then, of course, again, he just ruthlessly undercut all the local butchers because he had efficiencies of scale on his side and so on and so on, which, of course, is another aspect of the modern food industry that was pioneered in Chicago. Um, can't even remember what we started talking about that ended me up there. But anyway, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, no, I uh, think the... So <laughs> It's funny because there are so many parallels to be done with other flows as well. So you mentioned Paris and, and the oh, Seine yeah. and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and how um, actually it froze a couple of years in mm. a row mm. and that couldn't, they couldn't transport wood for yes. fuel. Um, mm. yes. And that's precisely also the moment when they start using coal instead of, uh, of wood. Yes. So yes, it's yes. funny how the same story of of a mega transition happens yeah, yeah. due to, as you say, a transportation or an Very infrastructure. Much. So much. I'd like to perhaps, if we can summarize this this orchestration of changes that happened in the 18th to 20th of century. So there mm -hmm. there is a change in fertilizers there is a change yeah. in mm -hmm. transportation there's a mm. change of making food there's a mm. change of mm. eating habits everything everything, everything. Mm -hmm. in, i remember i mean one century started, or so yeah 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 i mean a century and kind of a century and a half almost getting on for two centuries because for me it begins with the railways actually uh, which is kind of 1830s but you know you're absolutely right i mean you you asked me about value actually i now remember and it's a really important thing to say is that you know um, in the old days, as you rightly said, you know, people knew the value of food because it was difficult to produce. And what industrialization did effectively, and I've, I've talked about the negative side of it, obviously the positive side of it is that it produced massively more food at costs that were not immediately apparent, but then started to become apparent. So, for example, the Midwest um, turned into the famous Dust Bowl, you know, because you can't just, you know, trans change a kind of a a grassland that's being, I mean, you know, as I said, nature puts animals in ecosystems for a reason. So the reason there were so many bison grazing the, the grasslands, you know, of, of the American Midwest is because 
you know, bison nibble the grass, keeps the grass nice and short. They trample the soil with their feet, which keeps the, the soil nice and stable. And they poo on the land, which keeps it fertile. So that's just a beautiful ecosystem. And of course, what regenerative herdsmen are trying to do now is recreate that process. You know, and they move groups of animals around. And it's and, and also, you know, animal dung is just a much more available form of nutrition to plants than you've, again, probably covered this in other conversations that you've had with other people anyway so so but of course as i say it created the illusion of of cheap food which doesn't actually exist and as you said fertilizer was another one that came along so justus liebig was this brilliant german chemist he was the first chemist who i mean actually interestingly he was the first person to really look at human nutrition at all and he, he was the one who came up with the sort of the broad categories of protein carbohydrates and fats that we still use today um, but he also looked at what plants needed and worked out that, you know, what they predominantly needed was p potassium, phosphorus and nitrogen, you know, hence NPK, not necessarily in that order. Um, and of course, that was really the beginning of the awareness that, you know, sort of putting artificial chemicals on the soil. I mean, people had done that for centuries. They put, you know, guano on the land for centuries without really knowing why. So it was Liebig who really sort of began to do the chemistry of working out why. But the real game changer was when two other German chemists called Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, who you may have covered in other podcasts as well. Um, on on and, wastewater. So just to give you a, okay, a context. Okay, how yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Well, basically, they came up with a way of um, basically uh, artificially recreating a lightning strike. Now, why would you do that? The reason is that nitrogen is the critical um, element for plants and most of it is in the air, most of it's in the atmosphere. So there's only two ways that nature can get nitrogen into the ground. One is through um, leguminous plants, which have special nodules on their, on their roots, which can actually transfer, they can capture the atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into nitrates and so on, and then the plant can take it up, which is why, of course, again, for centuries, people, you know, sowed leguminous crops, you know, crop rotation that we all started in geography and without understanding what on earth it was all about. You know, it's actually about getting nitrogen in the ground. Um, but the other one is a lightning strike. Um, and that's what the Harbour Bosch process reproduces. And the really mind bending thing, I think, is that and there's a brilliant book by a guy called Vaclav Smil, S-M-I-L, <laughs> called Enriching the Earth, where he, you know, this book, which he talks about all of this stuff, basically, um, you know, he estimates that, that two out of five people would not be on the planet now were it not for the Harbour Bosch process. So that gives you some idea. And I think the number is even greater now. It may be half. So let's just say somewhere between, you know, sort of 40 and 50 percent of the global population are now fed on a chemical, you know, on the sort of the, the industrial chemical model which uses not only fertilizers, artificial fertilizers, but also pesticides and herbicides, because once you're starting to chuck chemicals on the land, everything goes out of balance. And this is what organic farming is trying to counter. So I just need to now tell you a little bit about how organic farming works, because because it's really, really important to understand. Um, and actually, Albert Howard is really the father. If, if Justus Liebig, in a way, is the father of chemical farming, then Albert Howard is the father of modern organic farming. Of course, organic farming is the only farming we had until chemical farming came along. But anyway, um, he, he was the agronomist, he's an English agronomist, who actually was the first person to really start to understand what goes on in living soil. And what he worked out was that what happened is that the plants roots form living connections with uh, soil fungi in the soil and plants of course as, as well as we all learnt in our biology lessons and again didn't mean anything photosynthesis what does that actually do creates sugar out of sunlight and water and what you can do so the plants can create sugar which is why they're the basis of the global food system they feed the sugars to the soil fungi what can the soil fungi do they can extract minerals directly from rock so basically, all the micronutrients that both the plants need and also we need, because, of course, plants are the basis of our food system, too, are based on living soil and these living connections. And 80 percent of cultivated plants in the world depend on these on these connections. Now, if you imagine what you do when you plough the land every year, 
is that you break all those connections up and they have to form again. Now imagine, this is even more spooky, what happens when you feed those plants the plant equivalent of fast food, which is a nice little dose of MPK. They don't bother to form those living connections at all because like feeding your kids McDonald's every day, they don't. They think they're full. They think they're well nourished. They're not. So the plants don't form those living connections, which mean they don't get the micronutrients from the soil fungi, which mean that the complexity of their diet is reduced, which reduces their health, which is why you have to start pumping more herbicides and pesticides onto them because they lose their own defensive system. But guess what? We eat the plants and it, it depletes our defensive system as well. So that's the problem with chemical farming at the level of human health and plant health. Um, but of course, you know, that doesn't even start getting into the territory of what happens when you put all those chemicals on the ground to insect life, bird life and so on, which, of course, is now the source of a sixth mass extinction in all the chemically farmed areas of the world. So, I mean, I think that argument is over. So we, we're now in a position where half the world is fed on a system that we can no longer carry on using. So then, you know, the big question becomes, oh, can we shift to organic farming? The good news, by the way, is yes, we can. But we have to do two things. So I don't know whether you want me to talk about all this stuff, but again, it's just sort of, as I say, one thing leads to another, leads to another. Um, I'm taking notes, don't worry. We, we, we're going <laughs> to circle back somewhere. We can get back to cities at some point. But of course, you know, I mean, the, 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 a very, very critical part of all of this is that half, you know, more than half of us now live in cities. And, you know, the vast majority of the increased expected population by 2050 is going to be urban. So again, these problems of how you feed people only get, get deeper over time. But um, basically, you know, all I was going to say is the good news is that if we globally halve the amount of deep meat and dairy that we eat, and, 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 and of course, in the West, that means reducing it a lot more because we already eat crazy amounts of the stuff. But, you know, globally reduce it by half and, of course, stop uh, industrial livestock production, which is just bonkers. Um, and so move to a plant, but more, much more plant based diet, but with some meat and dairy because of the regenerative thing I've already talked about. And we halve, halve the amount of food that we waste, which, again, if you value food, you don't waste it. You know, so in the West, that's incredibly doable. In the, the global South, it's harder because actually food waste in the global South is a lot more to do with lack of infrastructure than, than actual people not valuing food. They absolutely do value food. So it's a different set of problems. Tristram Stewart's book on waste is the Bible to go to for all of that stuff, just in case. Anyway, um, so we can then feed the world on current form, as it were, taking, by the way, climate change um, effects, assuming that all the predictions going down the middle. So, you know, from the best prediction to the worst going down the middle, we could feed the world as it currently stands. 80% uh, organically without increasing the amount of farmland we currently use. So this is a really important statistic, I think. Now, what about that 20% gap? That 20% gap is all about nitrogen, interestingly. So I mentioned before, nitrogen is the key. But guess what? We've invested absolutely zero uh, research into growing organically, fixing nitrogen naturally and so on, because there's no money to be made in this for the big corporations and so on. So other studies predict that if we actually just invested in working out how to fix nitrogen regeneratively, and that they're amazing, uh, you know, I could just talk to you about these incredible projects going on at the moment that's showing how possible this is, we can close the so-called uh, yield gap within a decade. So, so then we can be doing it. So yes, we can do it. Is 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 the the happy headline? I'm here to share with you. <laughs> well, I have good news for you because um, so I had another guest working on on closing the loops of nitrogen and phosphorus within okay. cities. Okay. Okay. Um, and mainly through urine because ur it's within urine yes. that most of them come, not through uh, feces and. So back in the day, I think it was in Paris, we recycled 50% of nitrogen. Yeah. Today, it's like less than 5%. And yeah. he estimated that if we reuse uh, urine from, from Paris today, we could fertilize 
grain and produce like 25 million baguettes per day or something like that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you have to do the marketing very carefully. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, we can do this is the point. We can absolutely do this is the point. And that's very good to know. And of course, I'm not a plant scientist, you know, but again, I mean, what, what I love about food as a subject is that it leads you absolutely everywhere. And you have to learn a little bit about everything because it all joins up, you know. So that's good to know that someone who really knows what they're talking about is telling you, is basically agreeing with what I'm telling you. Excellent. And it's the same. So he's looking at the same stuff as you're doing, but from a different angle. And so, for instance, nitrogen or the Haber-Bosch is responsible for 5% of global carbon emissions as well. You know, so yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. many co-benefits if we think about exactly, it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because imagining a lightning strike, that's not a trivial event in a lab. Yeah. Uh, funnily enough, Leibig, so you, you kind of said that he opened the Pandora box, but he also coined the term metabolism. Right, yeah. right. And, yeah. and, and 20 or 30 years after Leibig came Karl Marx, and he used the word metabolism, saying that, you know, it's the way that we, um, how you call it, um, the way that we extract uh, the capitalism system extracts from nature that has this metabolic point of view. And this is how urban metabolism kind of arrived as a discipline through all of this, Leibig, then Marx, then a number of other people. So, yeah, it's interesting to to see that there is a a, a nexus between all of this. The the, the systemic use of uh, of uh, of nitrogen, of water, mm. of all of this kind of arrive mm. at the same time. You kind of touch upon it during the waste uh, chapter of your book. Yes, yes, uh, about the yeah. linearity of of wastes, but yes. this linearity goes again through nitrogen through phosphorus through energy because energy was renewable also back in the day right and it was it was wood as well so it, it's it's fascinating yeah it is really fascinating and i mean i think there are as you absolutely said there are direct connections between food and energy you know and other things that are necessary for life all raw, raw materials you know i think you know we move from an era when People thought nature was inexhaustible, basically, and it's very understandable that they thought that, you know, and I often say this about Adam Smith, you know, I think he gets it in the neck a lot, you know, for having kind of, as it were, been the father of capitalism and so on. But, you know, you forget that he's writing in the 1760s, you know, I mean, at a time when, you know, the idea that we could run out of nature just seemed completely inconceivable. And also, at the same time, that, you know, he wrote this other very famous book that nobody ever talks about, but called, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in which he said that, you know, of course, any economic system that we come up with has to be balanced by human empathy, you know, and the two things have to work together. So I think, as you say, there's a sort of dawning awareness of the circularity of things um, that happens at the same time. And I mean, I, again, as you say, in my book, I write about... Um, you know, the sort of, in fact, Victor Hugo, of all people, who, who I mean, I, it's just, I find it absolutely astonishing that, you know, in the middle of, you know, arguably one of the most uh, sort of famous books of the 19th century, Les Miserables, there's a sort of 70-page essay on sewers, you know. <laughs> you know, he just, he just, you know, he sends his kind of his, his hero down the sewer and then he just stops talking, the story stops, and then he starts talking about sewers you know, and how important it is and how, you know, you can judge a society by what it throws away because that's what it doesn't value. And all these amazing quotes, like the sewer is a cynic, you know, the sewer sees everything. And I, I just found that utterly, utterly fascinating. And, and of course, he also wrote to the English uh, Parliament to try to stop them from building the, the London sewers because he said you're throwing all this valuable nutrition away you know and of course now as you say we're realizing oh there's such a thing as peak phosphorus and actually the most readily available source of this stuff is <clears throat> you know <laughs> what what we're kind of um emitting from our own bodies every day so yes I think that that's a super super interesting concept and I think you know, for me, it becomes, I mean, again, you know, one of the books that I read more recently that I found really fascinating in this respect is, um, I don't know whether you know Timothy Morton's work at all, and uh, his book Dark Ecology, he'd be super interesting to talk to, actually. Um, 
but he writes about the fact that you know we find it really difficult to deal with the fact that we live on a planet where you know nothing is ne- nothing ever goes away there is no throwing things away it's always still lurking there somewhere you know and how we can come to terms with this sort of psychologically because you know of course you know we had had as you say we've you know capitalism is a very sort of linear idea um ironically sort of coming out of a, a time when absolutely everything was circular i mean you know the sort of the, the the medieval city is an absolutely beautiful example of circularity and you know again to come back yet again to the 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 subject of human and animal manure you know it was absolutely seen as this precious thing to be saved and then sort of matured and then put you know on the fields around the city to fertilize them so you've literally got this going on you know and it's 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 exactly when we started doing this and treating nature as free grabbing it and just throwing it over there um that the problem started and i mean this is actually why i often talk about the fact that we are living in what i call the neo geographical age so i think you know when the railways came you know that was uh, and i often sort of say it's it's that was the moment when we said goodbye to geography because railways appeared to emancipate us from all of these issues that we've been facing in terms of how to feed a city and where you could build cities and just moving stuff around you know and it was i mean very disturbing to people at the time as well it took a lot of getting used to that you could just travel very rapidly but of course again now we've seen you know i mean through lockdown as well we've seen how much we've come to rely on just being able to travel everywhere all the time and it's it's now very difficult for us to to understand that no we can't just travel doesn't come for free either you know because it costs energy and and therefore actually we're going to have to learn to live more locally and regionally and seasonally again which i think can all be presented as positive things by the way um but i think we have to sort of and this is why i think you know one of the things that i say is that we need a sort of um a vision for what a good life looks like in what i call the neo geographical age so the neo geographical age is the age where you know as Tom- Timothy Morton says we realize oh there is no throwing stuff away you know there's a plastic ocean gathering in this uh, you know in the antarctic and you know the, nothing that we use goes you know anywhere we live in a circular world um and that is a sort of a mental adjustment we have to make but if you then see that as um you know sort of as it were cultivating your own patch as a positive thing you know and uh, again i mean it's it's not a new idea i mean uh, the, the sort of cradle to cradle you know this idea that you sort of everything that you create you create with a view of what its entire life cycle including its rebirth as it were which of course is our condition as humans as well you know which is something we also struggle to understand is that we will go back in the soil and we will become part of you know new life eventually um it can be presented as an incredibly exciting positive thing but but we have to sort of unpick our idea of a good life i often say our idea of a good life is still mired in the 20th century you know we're still addicted to consumerism we're still of course addicted to capitalism which needs us to be con- addicted to consumerism or it fails um so we need to uncouple us i know you've talked to kate rayworth so i don't have to bang on about that luckily um but you know we need to uncouple ourselves from you know that the whole it's not just an economy it's a whole psychology of what it means to to exist on the planet um and i think we have to as i say construct it you know in terms of a vision of a good life um which i believe is absolutely possible and this is really what i write about in in my book Cytopia which I should explain what it is by the way yes please do um, and if I'll do it I'll show you I might have to show switch myself you on so I can actually see whether you can see what I'm showing you um but but I don't know whether you can see there the yeah. the definition of Cytopia it just means food place um and I invented the word as a as an alternative to utopia that's why I went greek and the reason is that you know i think we clearly desperately need a multilateral connected way of asking all the big questions you know asking what is a good life what is a good society how do we coexist with nature how do we coexist with each other 
um, which of course is what utopianism is, except utopianism aims at an ideal and therefore can't exist. And it was actually when I read this, you know, the you in utopia can either come from the Greek word for good or the Greek word for no. So it's a good place, but no place, you know. And I remember that really depressing me when I read it because I thought, ah, you know, we this is our greatest tradition of thinking in a sort of holistic way about how to live and it can't exist. And and that is when I had the idea of inventing this alternative word, sitopia. So, you know, we live in a world shaped by food, um, but we live in a bad sitopia because we don't value food. But if we did value food, we would live in a good sitopia. And a good sitopia, by the way, comes quite close to utopia. So w what does sitopia look like? If we manage somehow to, to build... The, to reconcile the two pressing challenges of tomorrow, feeding and housing the global po population. I have a sort of bad drawing for you. <laughs> it kind of looks like this. I mean, this is actually the structure of of of, of Cytopia, the book. Um, you remember my bowl of soup I was banging on about? That is at the heart of everything. And around it, you've got people sharing. And we evolved as a species through the sharing of food. We're very good at sharing through food. So that's fundamental. So you have love, connection, often family, of course. Somebody cooked the food. Cooking is often done with love as well. It's quite difficult to cook well without love. You know, it's a, feeding and nourishing is a, is, a, is a very natural act. So that might be a parent figure, a mother, a father, whoever, other sexes are available. You know, so that becomes, if you like, the space of the home. But of course, most people's food doesn't come from the home. From So where does it come from? It comes from a market, you know. So the cook figure will have bought the food from someone, you know. So there you have economy, you have trust, you have knowledge exchange, you have all sorts of connections there. Where does the market sit, you know, in the city? Where does the city sit in this thing called countryside we talked about before? Where does the countryside sit in a thing called nature, which we can also discuss because we are, of course, part of nature, And where does all that sit? Well, sort of on a planet whizzing through the universe very rapidly, you know. So actually, if you turn that that sort of on its side and draw a line through it, that's the structure of my book. Um, but it's also what Zootopia looks like. It's a sort of, it is a system. Everything is connected. Everything affects everything else. It's all about the living world. And it's about how we encounter it every day because we eat And it, about how it creates sort of loving connections, you know, connections of power, connection, you know, political, economic, you know, but how it ultimately defines our relationship with nature and with the natural world. So obviously, depending on where you live, you know, it's going to look different because, you know, ultimately this bit, you know, the nature bit is 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 different from, you know, I mean, in, in France, you would say from one field to the next because of terroir and so on. But, you know, and of course, but but those those sets of connections are constant everywhere, you know, and, and of course, you know, the countryside has farmers in it, you know, and and this is inhabited by companies and it's inhabited by power structures, you know, all of which are invisible to us, but all of which shape our world. But actually, because we eat and because we, we don't grow most of our own food, most of us, and therefore we pay to eat, you know, it shows you that the act of eating is a, always a political act. It's always an ecological act. It's always an economic act. It's always a social act. It's always a cultural act. You know, it's just, it is the thing that, you know, I often say is too big to see because it just, it shapes everything. That's what Zootopia looks like. It's, it's, a, it's a food shaped world. Um, but we can shape it by how, by how we eat and how we vote. Yeah, and I can imagine that the cities based on Zootopia would look very much differently as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, interestingly, but, quite a lot of cities in the global south look quite like, you know, my idea of a Zootopian city, because, of course, they haven't stopped growing food in the city, which which historically we did. I mean, I talk endlessly about, you know, the market gardens that used to surround cities. Most people kept pigs and chickens in their houses. Why? Because pigs and chickens are omnivores. They can eat our food scraps and then... I'm afraid we can eat them, them but, you know, know that's, that's, that's why we go involved with pigs and chickens. So they'd be, yes, they'd be highly productive. And I write a lot about, I mean, Patrick Geddes, you know, the, the father of regional geography, if you like. You know, he talked, I mean, his wonderful phrase, you know, we have to make the field 
come to the street as well as the street come to the field, you know, and he was arguing. And of course, all utopians do this. This is why, again, I felt inspired to create the word sitopia. All utopians talk about how to bring city and country together, as I said right at the start. You know, that's what the Garden City tries to do. And, and it does it by what I call the fried egg urban model. So the fried egg urban model is another way of seeing the city state. So the yolk of the egg is the city and the white is the countryside. And that's what early cities were like. You know, they were literally blobs of urbanity surrounded by the land that fed them. And then the Greeks start to talk about explicitly about, you know, how to feed the ideal city. And they say, well, you have to keep the city small because, you know, the ideal thing is, Oikonomia. Now, oikonomia, which means household management, and again, I'm sure you talked about it. You, you, you talked to Herman Daly, didn't you? Yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. one of my absolute heroes. You know, I mean, this is so exciting. So, I don't have to tell you about oikonomia because he will have told you all about it. But you know, household management. You know, the idea that each citizen has a farm that feeds the house, and therefore they're self-sufficient. And if all citizens have the condition, then the city can feed itself. It is. Economic and of course, economia gives us the basis for our word economics. It's just rather tragic that we didn't take the actual meaning that Aristotle had when he talked about it for our economics, which is basically um, that the city and country find a natural balance because surprise, surprise, there's a limit to how much any of us can actually eat. You know, and he distinguished it. Well, anyway, Herman Daly covered all that for you, so I don't have to cover that for you. But um, no, I mean, basically, that is the sort of the Setopian city has a lot of food growing in it. And the Setopian countryside, by the way, has a lot of people living in it. You know, I mean, I absolutely I'm a, I'm a sort of somebody once said to me in an interview recently, oh, you've turned into an anarchist. I mean, I am an anarchist to the extent that I think Peter Kropotkin's ideas of and again I don't know whether somebody's talked to you about all of that but you know the idea that you know a good life is one in which we get to do more than one thing you know so it's not being in Adam Smith's factory just putting the heads on the nails all day to create wealth it's actually maybe growing some potatoes in the morning making furniture in the afternoon and writing poetry in the evening or something so what does a landscape look like that supports that kind of life you know, and if it's a city, it needs lots of nature in it. And if it's nature, it needs lots of urban infrastructure in it. So I'm not saying everything's just a sort of carpet of, I mean, you know, he famously wrote this book called Fields, Factories and Workshops. Um, I'm not saying everything's just a carpet of, you know, fields, factories and workshops, but I am saying that it's about bringing society and nature together much more in a variety of ways and at a variety of scales so that you and me and all other political animals who have a need for society and for nature can lead these fully rounded lives that have so much primary satisfaction in them that we don't have to be consumers anymore because we're also producers, you know. And this is, if you like, the, the vision of life in Zootopia is we're growing more of our own food, not all of it. We're making or mending more of our own stuff you know, we're swapping more, we're living more locally, more seasonally, um, but we're doing real things, you know, and, and and therefore we just have more meaning in our lives. And I think, you know, again, some people discovered this under lockdown, that, you know, there was a way of life that didn't involve just being in a sardine can for four hours a day to go to a place called a city to earn, do a really boring job sitting at a desk to get rich, to lead a good life that you're apparently going to have when you're 65. But actually yes. having more time now makes us happier, you know, but capitalism destroys time. So we have to destroy capitalism, or at least the kind that do is not regulated by moral sentiments, as Adam Smith said. Um, before we finish this, there is something I really wanted to talk to you about, because I, I love this. It's, uh, you talked about this, uh, this work of George Dodds that had very good accounts of the food flows of London yeah. at the at the daily rate almost. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like last year, we were doing this work for for uh, oh, you have a book of his then. That's oh, the book. Oh, fantastic! I mean, and you know, I said at the beginning, I'm just interrupting you, but you know, I said at the beginning that when I had the idea of writing about how a city feeds itself, uh -huh, uh -huh. I was looking, looking, looking for, for the, the section in the library where this would be. 
I, I didn't find anything for about two, two years, maybe. And then I found this book and it's written in 1856. And it was the only one I found, but it is absolutely incredible. And as you say, he literally lists, you know, how many cattle kind of got sold in, you know, Smithfield Market on a particular day. And it's an amazing book. Anyway, sorry, carry on. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, how wonderful, well, I'm very biased, right? But how wonderful <laughs> this book is because um, last June or so, we were accounting for the flow, the food flows of London, actually, for, for re-London. Uh, it's full of things like this. And we we can't yeah. do that today, right? No, I mean, no, 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 no. Right? If we have to, 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 to account for them, it would be impossible. And impossible. back in the day, he was writing... We don't know how much needs to be supplied every day, yet it happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so this is, I, love it. I don't know, breathtaking. And uh, uh, yeah, on the one side because we account for it, and on the other because we have no idea. Mm. Uh, yeah, sorry. I have before we close the episode. I had to talk about this. That was absolutely yeah. No, to me, I mean, it, 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 this is an absolutely brilliant book, and I, I, I use the quote of his right at the beginning of of my book. Um, I mean, you can see here the first opening sentence, the supply of food to a great city is a remarkable phenomenon, um, full of instruction on all sides. It teaches much concerning the substances whence the food is formed, the processes of formation, the communities whose industry develops the edible treasures, and so on and so on. But I mean, it's just, it, you know, and then as you say, this bit, which I think is absolutely amazing, Perhaps the most wonderful characteristic is that nobody does it. No one assumes the responsibility. It is useless to ask by what central authority or under what controlling system is a city such as London supplied with food. Nobody does it. No one, for instance, took care that a sufficient quantity of food should reach London in 1855 for the supply of two millions and a half of human beings during 52 weeks. And yet such a supply did reach London. So he's really talking about free trade and the fact that it just does its, I mean, it's just, it's brilliant. It is brilliant. So, I mean, you know, I wasn't the first person to ask this question. <laughs> There's another one. I mean, food fanatics like me and or food and city fanatics like me all revere this book like a Bible, but it's it's not known. I mean, as I say, I just happen to be lucky enough to get this reprint of it. I mean, it's not a widely known book, but it is a brilliant book. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, the thing is that how on earth are we surviving when we don't know how much we need? I know. And yet it supplies. This, this is mind boggling. I don't know how. Yeah. I mean, if you said that thanks to Haber Bosch, there is perhaps that many million of uh, or a billion of people that survived. Yeah. Still, how do we survive if we don't know these numbers? Well, we overproduce, of course. I mean, Marion Nestle famously in her food politics books, you know, said that there's over 5000 calories of food available every day to every American adult and child and baby you know so literally there is double the amount of food that could be safely eaten available every day in america so the only way the food companies can make money is by overselling food which is why americans are all the size they are well not all of them but you know so this is insanity total insanity and and again this is why you know people like tristram stewart who writes so brilliantly about waste you know he says it's not about not being able to produce the quantities of food we need we can do that it's all about regis it's all about distribution it's about where the stuff actually is and where it ends up and therefore it's about economics and therefore it's about politics and about trade and about all the stuff we started talking about right at the beginning you know you cannot I mean, to ask how are we going to feed the world is the most stupid and idiotic phraseology. I mean, it drives me nuts. You know, A, who is we? B, who is the world? C, does it want us to feed it? You know, and it's just, it's the kind of, it's the big ag mentality that kind of puts it like that. You know, the question we should be asking is, how can we as a species, you know, as humans, live good lives on a limited planet with a bunch of non-humans without which there is no life? And what does that good life look like? And then what kind of food system would actually create that kind of life? It's literally the other way up. 
you know, which is why I always say, you know, food is the greatest medium for, for asking the big questions, like how should we live? What is a good life? What is a good society? What is our relationship with nature? What is our relationship with our fellow humans? And food just sits at the heart of all of those questions that matter. That's that's why I love it. That's why I wake up every day, 22 years later, still excited to learn more and to think about it more because it, it just really is a, an extraordinary medium for, for thinking and acting. So um, if we have to... Um... To, to say what what ha, what you do you still want to learn what what will you learn in, in 2022 and what are your plans of you know continuing this uh, obsessive uh, research of food and cities I mean my subject is life so I will never run out of things to learn about I mean it's very interesting I mean I, as I said to you I mean I, the books I read at the moment I mean every there's so many incredible books being written at the moment um, like the dawn of everything I mentioned. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is an amazing book I'm reading at the moment. I don't know whether you know it. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, incredible book. Uh, the Timothy Morton book I mentioned. Um, I mean, all of these incredible, you know, dis people discovering more about, you know, the way soil works and the way our microbiome works. I mean, I mean, probably I'm most motivated ultimately at the moment, to be honest, by politics because the politics at the moment I mentioned the war in Ukraine I just I can't get my head around the fact this is going on I mean it's just so horrific and you know in a way I mean I think my 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 search has become a search for just as I say understanding what a good human life looks like and what it is that makes us happy because you know if we can understand that and if we can provide that for people then I think that's our best chance of avoiding the kind of appalling you know political meltdowns that we continually see happening you know if you if you if you look at the sort of the you know when it when stuff goes wrong to put it in a very very kind of um you know childish way almost It's because people aren't being provided with the wherewithal to lead good, meaningful lives, you know. And I guess that turns me into a utopian, <laughs> despite my efforts not to be one. But, you know, I just, I just, I, I think we know what makes us happy and I think we can provide it for people. And I think it's really, really simple things. You know, it's, it's obviously enough to eat, good food. It's obviously a safe place to live, a nice place to live. It's peace. You know, it's it's a sort of supportive community. Uh, it's meaningfulness, you know, so people have real stuff to do. And it's one of the great, you know, ironies and tragedies of human history that, you know, people tend to sort of become their better selves during crises. So I think, you know, we're seeing it in Ukraine now. I mean, I think the whole world is just, you know, falling in love with Ukrainians. They're just extraordinary people, aren't they? And I mean, the way they're reacting, you know, and just, they're just remarkable people. And, You know, I think, you know, actually probably part part of why they are so remarkable is that because their lives have been under threat for so long. And I think when you're, you don't take life for granted, then you live life to the full, you know. And this is the Stoic philosophy. I mean, again, which I sort of write about in, in Zootopia. You know, if you, if you realize that life is precious and fragile, then you tend to take, you know, more care to live it well and enjoy it. And I think, you know, part of the problem of the whole Western capitalist model is that it sort of tried to take all the pain away, take all the work away, take all the struggle away. Oh, there's a pill for that. Oh, you know, there's a, there's an answer for that. You know, it's like the, what I call the kind of the, the, the life hack, you know, the life hack of life hacks. We can life hack everything, but there's, then there's nothing left to do. You're not even human anymore. You know, so I think bizarrely, Actually, now, I mean, facing these incredible global threats that we do, everything from climate change to mass extinction to, you know, war and not just in Ukraine, of course, but, you know, appalling political catastrophes unfolding everywhere. It's a wake up call. You know, this might be humanity's last, sh you know, throw of the dice. Can we please wake up? Can we please, you know, realize that we can share this planet, you know, well? We can live well and there is space for everyone. And and remember what makes, you know, what, what makes a good life. And of course, good has two sides to it. It's good for us, i.e. it makes us happy, 
but it's also good for all the the new the humans and non humans with whom we share the planet. So it has to be ethically good as well. Um, and again, I come back to food. You know, I mean, my vision of a good society is one in which everybody eats well because. You can't eat well if there are bombs falling on your head. You can't eat well if somebody else is eating badly. You can't eat well if the food you eat, you know, is destroying a landscape somewhere or involve cruelty or slavery or, you know, so so much is held again. And I'm I'm coming back to my bowl of soup again, you know. But if that bowl of soup is a good bowl of soup and everyone has a good bowl of soup and they can share it in peace, then then you're pretty much there. You know, and it's a really simple idea um, in a really complex world. And I think in a complex world, we need simple ideas that have complexity within them. Well, I think uh, there is no better way to to end this, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to go have a bowl of soup, uh, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> That's what I'm soup. eating <laughs> tonight, uh, uh, which is butternut. But uh, yeah. Oh, uh, lovely. Perfect. Mm, mm. Well, th thanks so much, Caroline. I think, uh, yeah, you, you've transported me with food, uh, with uh, cities a bit as well, but mostly with food. Uh, we have a lot in common, but through different angles. And I will try to get a, a copy somehow of this George Dot book. Mm. Well, as I say, there are these facsimiles that exist. I mean, the one I had was actually an original 1856 edition. So I got it from the library and I was very... <laughs> I looked after it very well. So they are out there. You will be able to get a copy. Mm. And uh, indeed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thanks again so much. I think we have still so much to talk about, but um, I want to thank you and everyone for listening and watching until the end. And please don't hesitate to share with us, you know, your thoughts and your comments and what does Citopia look for you as well? Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to be surprised and we're going to have some, some good insights from you as well. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Forward. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, Aristide. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot.